everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob. It's me, Jackie. And it's me, Diana. Hi, everybody. How have you been doing? I've been doing so great, except I tried to do something today and there was a part of that something that was missing. What was missed? You, what, what were you like, trying to do? Why don't was, you tell me what you're trying to do? I was trying to bake a cake. You're trying to bake a cake, eh? Yeah. And what? Ha- so you, you were missing something? Something suddenly was missing? Yeah. You didn't have any eggs or something like that? Yeah, I thought I had a whole thing of eggs in the fridge. Mm-hmm. You know, when you look in and you see like the cart and you're like, I got so many eggs. Mm-hmm. Guess what? There were no eggs? Passed me, just put it back in the fridge no. to remind myself uh... that I needed to get more eggs. <laughs> That's a terrible system. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess one of two things could have happened when you saw there were no eggs. You could have said, you know, asked someone nearby, hey, are there any eggs? Could you find eggs? Or you could have just stopped and just sort of looked around. Rode the flower in the air. Just sort of given up, walked away, right? Yeah. Well, that's strange, Jackie. That's a strange anecdote you shared because it will come into play or tasks like it in today's episode of this podcast. And what is this podcast? Well, it's a podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, not about baking at all, because every week here, instead of talking about our favorite baking tips, we talk about research on a given topic in the field of behavior analysis. And we're going to be talking all about the conundrum that Jackie ran into. We're going to turn that negative situation into a positive outcome because we're going to be discussing interrupted chain procedures tonight. So we've got a couple articles we'll be reviewing. Do you want to know what I did? What did you do? I went and talked to my neighbor. Well, that's good. So you manded for for eggs from a distance. Yeah. Spontaneously. And then I said, from a distance, do you have any (laughs) eggs? Did they toss them over? Yeah. (laughs) Kind of hooked them right at the door? (laughs) So Diana, we've got some articles we'll be discussing. What are they? I'm going to tell you what they are right now. The first one is by Carter and Grunsell, and it is titled The Behavior Chain Interruption Strategy, a review of research and discussion of future directions that was published in the Journal of the Association for Persons with Severe Handicaps in 2001. Then we will be discussing an article by Albert Carbone, Murray, Haggerty, and Sweeney Kerwin. Titled, Increasing the Manned Repertoire of Children with Autism Through the Use of an Interrupted Chain Procedure. And that was published in Behavior Analysis and Practice during one of the two to three years that they didn't put the year on the journals. Mm -hmm. 2012. Whose idea was that? I don't know. We're going to save on pink. (laughs) (laughs) I also find those years to be odd in that they have these little pictures in the corner of all the articles, but the pictures never print out. So when you print your articles, you just get a big old rectangle, just a blank rectangle on the, yep, on the page. Yeah, that right here on What's the What's up with it? Did Getty Images not pay the license for you to print out the random picture know. of like, it's me and a kid, doesn't. we're smiling. It is, yeah. Not super sure. Two colleagues like sharing couple, ideas. Two to three years, I think, of the journal that they did yeah, a year on there. Work those kinks out. So it's kind of like, you know, when you find a first edition flaw mm-hmm. in something and you're like, this might be worth money. Mm-hmm. I, well, yeah, I'm sure my printout <laughs> of, of BAP from 2012 is worth millions. All right, and then we will be discussing an article by Robert Spinell and Sigafus titled Teaching Young Children with Developmental Disabilities to Request More Play Using the Behavior Chain Interruption Strategy, but they are Australian, so behavior has a U. And that was published in the Journal of Applied Research and Intellectual Disabilities in 1999. And then we have just a bonus article that is sort of like part of this discussion, although we may not review it specifically, but if folks are interested and want to catch up on more recent research, there's also this one by Summers, Seidner, Debar, and Seidner, titled Establishing Concurrent Mans for Items and Mans for Information about Location in Children with Autism, and that was in the Analysis of Verbal Behavior in 2014. Who was the primary author on that one, Diana? Summers. You sure it was Summers? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Are you sure? sure? Because my note said Summers, but then somebody changed my notes to say Seidner. Well, the, the article is titled Seidner, so I was had it in my head that that was the first author. I did too, so uh, it, it's not Diana's fault. Okay. It was a real, manda- like it was a real mandala it. effect on who wrote that article? I uh, No, I, I titled it incorrectly. Uh, so it is actually ultimately my fault. 
I'll take full blame. Okay, well. Full responsibility. You will be, you will be hearing a censure from the podcast commission <laughs> very shortly, Jackie. All right. That's the plan. So where did everyone first hear of interrupted chain procedure? Because you know, I'll be honest, reading these articles, I feel like th- it was a procedure that someone just sort of showed me once. And I said, that makes perfect sense. And I, I conceptually understand why you would do this. And I will now use this. And I never really gave it a ton more thought outside of that. I, I never actually asked, are there, is this, a, is there a name for what I'm doing here? Or is this just sort of, you know, it's a demand procedure. It's kind of a variation of a man procedure. It, it makes sense. And, and I will just go about my day and, and apply what we know about verbal operants and go from there. I mean, that was kind of my, my background with this. How about, how about you two? So full disclosure, one of my past year students found this article and gave it to me and was really excited about it and actually conducted her thesis on it. So she did a replication of the Austin study, uh, Albert study. I always say Austin. I she, you're going to get two censures from the podcast no, commission. I'm so sorry. The Albert study where she replicated their procedures with parent training. And so that's where I first heard of it, actually. So I've never, besides research, have never done it in real life. And I have a current student doing it right now. Spoiler alert, I'll tell you how it's going. Okay. I learned about it from Cooper, Heron, and Heward when I needed to teach my students about it <laughs> in the context of the task analysis lesson. And I said, oh, well, let's read up on interrupted chain procedures. And then I did. So is this just one of those procedures that everyone takes for granted? They're like, yeah, that makes sense. I get it. I know why that would work. I'm not well, giving it a name. When I'll I just talk do about it. my article, that's going to be my takeaway at the end. It's like, oh, yeah, I never ha- needed, maybe, or ha- at least had a name for this procedure. But it's totally something that we utilize a lot, mm-hmm. at least through my understanding. Mm. I, it's certainly something that I, I know I've had individuals, once they learn the concept of a man, they get very excited. And they're like, well, everyone will man for everything. And they sort of mix up the idea of motivating operations as their own personal you know motivation in the moment versus the motivation of a student they're like no no i want you to ask for this therefore <laughs> i've captured an mo not the same and it's like right. i don't think anyone wants right, to right, right. take this test right now so <laughs> they're not going to man for a pencil if you don't give them one they'll probably just say guess i'm not taking this test right so that's that's typically where i've seen it but it, it sort of feels like one of those technologies that Everyone figures out on their own, but perhaps it doesn't think through all the way or, th- or think of the angles, which I guess I'm always surprised how there are still areas in our field that have been have been had some research, but maybe not as much as you would think, given how seemingly ubiquitous those procedures are. I don't think this this one kind of falls into that category, at least for me. Where there's not a lot of research on it or the research is old. No, there, there is research, but it, it's like nobody bothered to look for it. They just assumed there was a ton of like great research somewhere. Like, I don't need to find it. That makes it's sense. It's like when you're trying to find like the original behavioral skills training article. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, there, there isn't one. Different people did some like versions of this and they all called it different things. And eventually they we converged on the term behavioral skills training, but it's not doesn't start in any one specific article. It's like, this is the example moving forward. This is exactly how it's going to be. It's a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of different people were doing this because honestly, it makes a lot of just sense Mm -hmm. to do this if you're trying to teach something. And eventually the body of research was built from like different, you know, research groups basically. And and everyone decided, let's call it the behavioral chain interruption strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's not to discount the utility of this procedure. It's it's just more, it's one of those procedures that you read about. Yeah, okay, I get it. It makes sense. Duh, yeah, exactly. right? No, of course. It, it is a useful procedure. And I think there are strategies, quote unquote strategies that we use in, in the field, right? But as behavior analysts, we need to always be referencing back to our conceptually systematic language with respect to the principles of learning. So we don't want to just have things that we carry around in our toolkit and call them a certain name, but not have a fuller understanding of how they really operate within the scope of learning. And this is one of those things. Like we all say, we're like, I don't know. Like I heard, I kind of heard about it after I learned how to do it. And I said, okay, that's the name of that thing. But just knowing the name of something doesn't mean that you know how it really works. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do this episode be just for that reason. Exactly. Right. That people may hear about an interrupted chain procedure or strategy and not have a full understanding of how it kind of fits in with the terminology that we should be using. Right. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I learned while being on various thesis committees, right, 
and hearing people smarter than me talk about this. Shout out to Emily Kerwin Sweeney Mm -hmm. or Sweeney Kerwin and Alan Carcina because they had a very lengthy discussion on Interrupted Chains while I was like, oh, wow. Wow. That's when you just nod and go, hmm, you listen. Oh, my goodness. Same. Ditto. (laughs) You guys are, oh, yep. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, I agree. You beat me to it. Yeah. (laughs) I was just about to say that. Let me add nothing of value, but I'll just keep talking so everyone thinks I know what I'm saying. Oh, I've been there. I think the biggest thing when when you're talking about interrupted chain procedure is you're looking for the relevant motivating operations, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the relevant motivating operations in place, then the interrupted chain will fall apart, Right. And it is vital that each step of the chain serves as a condition reinforcer for the previous step, which is like, I, I know that that's how TAs work, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's like absolutely vital in an interrupted chain because then there's no motivation to engage in that response, right? You could go in a different response. You could do another thing, right? You could mm-hmm. walk away, right? You could throw the flower in the air, like with my cake example. So it, that part, I think, is the most Critical part when you're trying to do this sort of task. So if you hated cake and everyone around you was like, oh, Jackie, stop making cake. There'd be no MO when you couldn't find the eggs. You just shrug and say, oh, well, and that's that's that. Right. Then and everyone would be surprised. Instead. Yeah, just make some Cakey bread. bread. Mm, make a cup. <laughs> oh, you're like, ooh, make that's a, he doesn't think even about know. Yeah, just, I wouldn't know. know. It's a brioche. A brioche? Cake. Is that what it would Cake. be? That actually has eggs. So oh. you can't make that. What could you make without Cakey eggs? bread's going to have eggs. Egg free. It's going to be egg free cakey bread. What's that it's called? It's going to be gross. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> but yeah. I don't okay. know what that's called. I'll get back to you. Okay. Well, why don't we get started off with a little review? I'm going to be talking about the Carter and Gresnell review of the interrupted chain procedure, as they call it. I think the technical term would be the behavior chain interruption strategy. The BCIS. The BCIS. It's the new edition of CSI. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to stop the murder in the middle of the murder chain. The only way. Are you going to start us off with the definition? We, I feel like we blew past the definition. Yeah. yeah well, that's part of the review. Okay. Great. They're going to review the definition, then. Okay. and then they're going to get into some details. So, again, like you said, Diana, this article came out in 2001. So we're going to start there, and then we're going to answer some of the questions they bring up. Not through our own that's research cool. necessarily, like but nice through the research that. that we discuss. I know sometimes, sometimes we just get it right that way. So when we talk about the behavior chain interruption strategy. It sort of falls under the broader category of what you'd think of as your naturalistic teaching techniques. So things like uh, incidental teaching would be another example. While this is not, inter- you know, it's not the same as incidental teaching, but it kind of falls into that same category of I can teach manding in the context of ongoing activities rather than in the context of, say, like discrete trial training. And really, you know, at, at its heart, it's just looking at what natural routines and opportunities exist where it would make sense to prompt some sort of communication that's occasioned by the interests of the learner. Most of the research on the BCIS has been with individuals with either severe disabilities or severe intellectual impairments or with autism. And it's been focusing on how can we prompt language or communication in these natural contexts in reference to sort of manding in the middle of these chains. So as far as I could tell from any of the articles we discussed, and as far as, you know, I could kind of cursorily look back on, Getsky and Saylor in 1985 kind of wrote up the initial description of the behavior chain interruption strategy. So, quote, insertion of a typical operant instructional trial into the middle of an ongoing flow of purposeful behavior. Basically, you interrupt someone in the middle of a familiar behavior change, and that's where you prompt the mand. Possibly the mand, stop interrupting my purposeful behavior, (laughs) for instance. (laughs) One of the real positives, and I think one of the reasons many of us probably sort of stumbled into using BCIS, is that it focuses on instruction that the individuals already are engaged with in their natural routines. So you're already kind of getting away from, oh, I wonder if the person would care about learning this communication. Well, they're engaged in these complex chains of behavior, so we have to assume that they would probably like to be able to have more control over the environment in relation to those chains of behavior. It just really requires some basic systematic prompting, nothing too fancy depending on your learner. But the difference from BCIS and say other naturalistic techniques is that the instruction happens in the middle of the sequence of behavior. So unlike some maybe incidental teaching procedures where you can do minor manipulations of the environment or you can just sort of wait around for the individual to sort of, you know, 
hey, whatever happened to the thing I was looking for, right? Here's a prompt for a man. You sort of do have to manipulate the environment for those opportunities to occur. You certainly could wait for those opportunities to occur, but unlike even incidental teaching, I think if you're waiting for someone to, like like Jackie's example, I'd have to wait around until the one time she wanted to make a cake and also forgot to have eggs or have some ingredient ready. Like, I could be waiting forever. Like that <laughs> morning, you're like, I'm going to steal the eggs. <laughs> But if I didn't, it could be years and years and years to get one trial of eggs, please, or where are the eggs? You know, so that's a long time. That's a real crappy ROI in terms of teaching uh, communication there. So why might BCIS work better than, say, just sort of, you know, prompting language out of the blue? And, you know, the the thought behind it being, well, I mean, you're really going to capture the MO without doing much work other than sort of sabotaging that chain because that sudden deprivation of the reinforcer, you know, like you were saying, Jackie, you're in a chain where each step of the chain is functioning as a cue as well as a reinforcer. So you're getting rid of that reinforcer. So it enhances the value of communication. So you got your MO right there and any response is going to result in that return of whatever that item is or whatever that you know, change in the environment is, is, you know, likely going to you know be reinforced. So it's also possible that we might have, you know, some negative reinforcement there because you're sort of interrupting someone's preferred routine or reinforcing routine. Once you communicate, fine, get the heck out of here. Please stop stealing my stuff so I can finish this chain of behavior. That could be another reason it works. And also there's some thought as to maybe it, it sort of functions to transfer the control of behavior to like an EO in sort of the blocked response form sort of the formalized term for sort of what that happens. So the behavior occurs only when a known reinforcer can only be obtained with additional a- action or object. So these kind of the three mechanisms that could all be going on. We're not quite sure which one is yeah. the most important. I usually just think of it as a change in, you know, change in MO or presentation of MO. It also is helpful because you really kind of get a, get away from that concern around, am I teaching communication that is going to generalize? Because you are teaching communication in the context of a preferred routine. So a routine that is probably going to happen pretty frequently. You know, you, certainly the goal is, can I teach this communication to occur at other times? And this is sort of where some of the future research answers questions when we talk about Carter and Grunzel's review. That, that was sort of one of the big questions because, again, a lot of the early research didn't really tackle, well, does the individual continue using this communication that they learned in the context of an interrupted chain at other times of the of the day or when more natural broken chains or interrupted chains occur. But, you know, you, you sort of assume, well, there's probably a better chance for generalization than, say, teaching something in like a cubby environment. And if the interruption can occur frequently enough, you probably expect to see some maintenance of that new communication. So there's a chance that you, you know, interrupt a few times, teach a man, and then that man may just generalize and appear forever and ever and ever because of the ongoing natural environment and and actual interruptions that occur without therapist support. So there were 10 studies reviewed in this 2001 paper that sort of looked at, well, what happens when the behavior chain interruption strategy is used as the primary independent variable? So it's a huge component of the treatment. So what do you need? And really, when you look at sort of what you need to do BCIS, there's a, there were a whole lot of thoughts, you know, different, uh, different researchers said, well, you have to have a behavior chain with three or more links in it. The student has to be able to begin the chain, even though you've tried to interrupt it. So they can't just, you know, full stop, not engage anymore in the chain if you interrupt. They have to be able to keep going. And the only reason they don't continue the chain is because they're missing some piece. You know, you have to make sure that it's interrupted at a consistently previously identified point in the chain, which to me is a, has to be the same time in the chain every single time. There has to be a moderate level of they call distress is the term they use. That's a quote of the individual when you interrupt it. So it can't be so aversive when you interrupt the chain that the individual starts aggressing or crying. It has to be just like a mild distress. So maybe they sort of said, look, they're oh, looking man. around. They say, I oh, said, man. Oh, man. Right. Yeah. Where's my yeah. eggs? There's, there's a sense that there's some kind of a distress. Typically, you're going to prompt the communication using verbal cues, like, what do you want? You might use modeling, maybe physical assistance for other topographies of communication. They'd really rather you don't use verbal cues as a concern that then you're going to weaken the probability of spontaneity of language in the future, which is kind of always a concern with, you know, vocal prompts. But really, when you look at the body of research, these were all sort of statements that various people made. But it does seem like all you really need is to interrupt a chain. How long the chain is? Probably doesn't have to be three plus links in the chain. So you just have to interrupt a chain. You have to interrupt it in the middle of the chain. (laughs) So the middle of the ongoing activity. And it should probably occur in in as close to a naturalistic setting as possible and use some form of prompting or cueing. Right. Okay. so those are the key things. 
So as long as you have that, you're probably doing the behavior chain interruption strategy okay. If you're not consistent with your interruption, maybe that won't matter. The dis- degree of distress maybe doesn't matter too it's much. Just you need to establish mo- motivation exactly. to complete the chain for yeah. whatever reason. But if you're choosing a chain that has a long history of reinforcement for its completion, you probably can avoid, like, well, I have to make sure they look kind of sad when right. I do it's, this. It, it's probably not that important. I feel like they're just getting at, there needs to be motivation yeah. present. Distress is kind of an unfortunate term for yeah. me. Yeah. And the whole point here is that you're teaching some additional new skill. Mm-hmm. And we'll get into what that could look like. So it would take different forms depending on what piece of it was interrupted. So if there's a piece that's needed or there's needs to be a request for continuation, a request for help, a request for information, right? There's some reason why you're doing this. Not You're not just being mean and interrupting a chain for no reason. You're no. then prompting and teaching a new skill that would allow this behavior to become more flexible in the face of some adverse event that's preventing completion of the chain in the future. Exactly. Makes sense. So overall, those 10 studies showed it to be a pretty efficacious procedure. There were communication improvements in most of the participants. They varied in terms of their age from three to adulthood. They had a moderate to profound intellectual impairments. Many of the, the participants, some even had multiple disabilities. They could use this for multiple communication modalities like vocal, pictorial communication, gestural communication, signs. Even that one study that used a switch-activated device. So again, the, yep. you know, some, some real generality there. The procedures for starting the BCIS sort of varied. They they spent a lot of time in this study talking about like what's the base, what should the baseline be for the use of BCIS, which sounds like a real researcher question, not as much of a practitioner question. But really, the idea of you know what should baseline look like in the weeds. Really spent a lot of time, but but you know what's what's the purpose? Lose the forest. (laughs) (laughs) I think it was like what's the purpose? Are you trying to 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 demonstrate whether BCIS is better than a different procedure that you're just trying to increase communication? In, in in total versus just communication in one set, you know, whatever your point is, you can make all sorts of baselines to to demonstrate, you know, uh, effectiveness of the use of the BCIS. You could use this to increase the total rate of requesting. You can look at just general acquisition of communication in a very specific environment or a specific chain versus any other time. Really, again, these are all possible outcomes regardless of of who you're working with. We want our clients to be able to communicate and control their environment as much as possible so they can access more of the, the chains that they, they prefer to engage in. Most studies use some form of response prompting. Prompting. There was one that said they showed success without response prompting, which just feels like a good for you sort of a... It's like, wow, that's nice. How? <laughs> good job. Yeah. Congrats. What did you do there, right? <laughs> <laughs> but mostly it was just prompting the communication in the middle of the chain. I did find this odd in that they'd sometimes talk about, you know, but sometimes when you use the, the interruption uh, chain procedure, it doesn't work very well at the start of the chain, which just feels sort of like, that's okay, great. I assumed that your yep. procedure yeah, <laughs> focusing on the middle of a chain wouldn't work so hot at the beginning, but perhaps it was more a yeah. sense of... I'm actually going to talk about that in my study. Okay, but yeah, I think it was more just a, it was, you know, the fact that if you're not interrupting the chain, of course, I wouldn't communicate for something I need in the middle of the chain before the chain occurs necessarily. <laughs> Like in Charlie uh, and the Chocolate Factory, when they're like, before the test was on Friday, but now the test will take place on Tuesday before you've learned it. <laughs> <laughs> Good example. Uh, the only real kind of verbal operants that were learned through BCIS, though, and this is kind of a limitation of the use of BCIS, it's really for manding. It's hypothesized that perhaps we could increase, you know, tacting or commenting, like, this is broken or this is missing, as well as I need those eggs or I need the pencil or, you know, whatever whatever the demand happens to be. But it's sort of very kind of limited scope in which you're going to use yeah. BCIS. And that, I don't think that's I think changed. it would be hard to argue that those are pure text either. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Again, another limitation was that most of the interruptions needed to be contrived. They didn't naturally occur, though. I think interruptions, you know, I think, Jackie, your interruption today was totally natural. I think the issue becomes if you need more than a trial or two to, right. you know, acquire the man, you probably would need to kind of fake the interruption a bit or to you know add the interruption yourself as the therapist just there might not be that many opportunities where the item is broken or my ipad's not working or i don't have the screwdriver i need to open this device whatever it happens to be the person goes buys a new ipad right they're like (laughs) no it's breaking they come out with so many damn ipads you know you you probably gotta update yours every six months anyway 
There were some studies that were able to demonstrate generalization to different missing items, or they could vary the materials in the chain, and it still showed an increase in demanding for the missing item. There was some generalization to the beginning versus the middle of a routine, but again, I couldn't quite conceptualize what the heck they were talking about when they described that. They didn't give an example in the study that really made me understand why you would want to make these requests at the beginning versus the middle of a chain, unless you knew, like, oh, God, it's Steve. He's going to steal my stuff again. Like, this guy always takes my eggs. Like, better start manning for eggs as soon as possible. I need to stockpile some eggs. (laughs) (laughs) I'll keep them. I'll show him. There were definitely some generalization to new communication partners. Sometimes you could even get generalization to untaught routines where the item was missing. Even some increases in generic communication. So instead of asking for a specific object or, you know, specific item, just making a statement, I want, I want, if they didn't know what the word was, they, they need to ask for, they just understood I couldn't complete the chain. So I'll just say want, and I'm not sure the word, which is, you know, that's, that's interesting. I think we want precision with language, but if you can't have it in the moment, it's better to, to let someone know that you need something. There were some limitations in terms of a lot of times there wasn't generalization unless there were the contrived interruptions. And again, it may have been that contrived interruptions themselves provide some sort of subtle cue to the individual of, hey, I'm paying attention to you. I'm looking for you to do something right now, which might have been a cue that controlled some of the behavior. Because, you know, when you think about it, you don't know when someone's missing something. You don't know they're missing something if you haven't taken it. And your behavior is going to be very different. You know, and one, you're standing right over them, getting ready to prompt, giving them the look of like, ah, you're going to ask for the thing that's missing. I hope you do. Whereas in real life, you'd say, oh, it looks like you're baking a cake. I'm going to go over here now and I probably won't be nearby to hear you if you're missing anything. There's also limited data on to whether this will improve the spontaneity. So will the individual make the man for the missing item in other, you know, other times without someone being nearby or, you know, in a very different chain? It's, it's kind of unclear. And then maintenance, uh, it happens to, you know, this procedure does pr- result in some maintenance. So the issue al- always is if you don't continue running those interrupted chains, will the man sort of, you know, be not exactly put on extinction, but will it sort of just fade away over time. That really leads us to a lot of the you know future research, which I'm not going to go into because a lot of it gets answered in the studies that we'll be talking about in a little bit. Pew, pew. Mm-hmm. So is BCIS uh, effective for you practitioners? Yes, it can definitely be used to increase requesting behavior. It's likely to demonstrate some level of generalization, possibly to new routines, possibly to new individuals, may even start occurring at the start rather than the middle of routines. Again, you know, BCIS might be seen more as sort of like a starter treatment. So let's use BCIS and then move on to other naturalistic teaching strategies. So maybe we start with BCIS to get, you know, some sort of a manned repertoire, then move into incidental teaching so we can really focus on maintenance and generalization. Because again, it's unclear how much routines get interrupted on a day-to-day basis. So if it only is happening because you are the one interrupting the chain, there's a chance that that communication will sort of fade over time. So you probably want to be planning for that if all you're going to use is BCIS and you probably shouldn't just use only BCIS. Uh, Though, again, some of our future research does point to perhaps generality or generalization of the skill being a little more robust than those 10 studies would lead us to believe. And so that kind of brings us up to the basics of BCIS. Why don't we take a little break? And when we come back, let's talk about what we've learned about BCIS since that 2001 paper and how it might be even more useful than was thought. We'll be right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. RegisCollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back 
talking about the interrupted chain procedure or the behavior chain interruption strategy, whichever one you want to use. But before we continue talking about research related to the BCIS, I want to remind all you listeners that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. And by listening to this episode, you can earn one learning credit. All you need to do is finish listening to the episode. Then go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get CEUs. That's G-E-T hyphen C-E-U-S. And soon we're going to have to do C-E-U-S too, because I was warned that we're running out of space on our original C-E-U page. But that's a problem for us listeners. Just go to C-E-U and (laughs) you'll find links to all sorts of stuff. There's also links in the show notes for this episode. Don't worry. Don't worry. You'll find it. You do need to put in two secret code words though. That I do have to tell you about. You can't just find those anywhere, uh, anywhere online. You have to hear it only here. And the first of those code words is pottery. P-O-T-T E-R-Y. It's clay objects, and you heat those objects up in a kiln, perhaps, and then you create all sorts of mugs, you know, earthenware bowls. If you ever get out to old Sturbridge Village. I know you're going to bring that you up. You can go to the potter. You can go to the potter, and they have all sorts of mugs mm-hmm. available. They're making mugs all day, and then yeah. every now and again, they, they fire up the big old kiln, and they get all sorts of pottery. Okay. You get a mug. They're, they're throwing them. They're throwing they them. Remember Ghost? Remember that movie Ghost? Yeah. They were making pottery there. Mm -hmm. Or was it just pottery? Wink, wink. That was unnecessary. (laughs) You remember that scene? Isley Brothers, you know? It's a a classic. Some of our listeners are young. They have never seen the movie Ghost. Dinah's rolling her eyes at me. So I guess it's time to start talking about pottery. And Ghost. And Ghost. But it's pottery. Pottery. Yeah. (laughs) If you write Patrick Swayze as a code word, we might give you credit anyway. Patrick Swayze. Also, I won't remember why. <laughs> like, Patrick's way. <laughs> it's like someone didn't just Crazy. write that out of the blue. Like, they must have said something. All right, that's enough saying about that. Let's say about the behavior chain interruption strategy. And so, Jackie, since 2001, there's continued to be research on the subject. Let's, let's hear about a little bit more detailed research, shall we? Yeah. Can I just say one thing, though? Yeah. Is it about ghost? No, no, no. It's about your article. Yeah. I pulled it up online. You know, we were before we were saying it's that black... Uh, blank box mm-hmm. where the picture goes online you can see the picture and it's like this adorable little boy making a sandwich who's making a peanut butter sandwich and he's so excited about it and he's like spreading the peanut butter and he's got his tongue sticking out and it's Aww. really cute so i just want to make sure we noted that he's way. happy till they steal the jelly and then it's all downhill from there it's like just don't pause. care it's like, it's like don't just ca- pause that. don't care about that jelly just keep <laughs> right? going eating peanut it. butter's where it's at <laughs> is the best prompt when you when you steal something where you go yoink and you take it right out of their hands no that's not that's what we not do okay so yeah so mine is looking at increasing man repertoires right and if you need a Quick and concise review of man's and man training. This introduction is for you. It is about a page and a half, and it gives you what a man is, right? It's a verbal operant in which the response is reinforced by a characteristic consequence and is therefore under the functional control of relevant conditions of deprivation or aversive stimulation. Page 35 and 36. AKA a command. Right, for all of you non behavior analy- analytic listeners. Or a demand. Or a demand. I thought you were being. Or you're the band now, dog. Oh, wow. You like that? So, you're really on a roll. Yeah, so many children that we may work with may not learn man's without direct teaching. And he cracked himself up. I know. <laughs> Can't handle it. I want a I t shirt. Just- <laughs> I want a You're the Man Now Dog t-shirt so bad now. I bet I can find you one. I'll get you one for your birthday. It's coming up. Yeah. So what I was saying was <laughs> mans don't emerge without direct teaching in many in many situations. Yeah. Right. And it is difficult to contrive a situation and where your learner is trying to request something that is not in sight. Mm-hmm. Right. Because sometimes out of sight, out of mind. Right. The the relevant establishing or motivating operations are not in place if the thing is not there so it is challenging for a practitioner to do what what uh to do this sort of man training mm. right when a, when something's not there and just be like don't you want right it's like hard you have to like whisper in their ear it's mm-hmm. like very difficult to do that impure man of right like, don't don't you want m&ms and then when they say you know the child says m&ms or, is, then, that, is, is that an echoic right. really is it a man yeah. really so i think this is one way that can help teach manding for a missing item or you know just increasing the variety of mans right because someone might not man for you know a cup or a bowl 
in their right in like in their natural environment because that's not salient for them right they don't want it at that point Mm -hmm. right unless it has to do with something so this study really looked at using the interrupted chain procedure to contrive motivation for these neutral items right that are part of a chain that will then produce a reinforcing item right so that terminal reinforcer is the thing at the end of the chain that they've done and the neutral item is one of the things in the middle that helps make the end reinforcer possible right like my eggs Mm -hmm. eggs alone don't care about them don't even like eating them but in order for me to make my delicious cake i need eggs right or brioche bread as we learned yeah i love eggs remember that commercial I don't. From my head down to my leg. No, but I'm glad you do. <laughs> Sounds like big poultry, big eggs has gotten to you, Diana. They're not paying us for that ad. So another thing that they did, another thing that they looked for is they tested for untrained tack acquisition, subsequent to man training in the context of the chain. So three participants with an autism diagnosis of between five and eight years of old, eight years old were participated in this study. They could all man for a variety of things, but could man for the variety of things in the presence of the item. Yeah. So the dependent variable was a type of man response emitted by the participant. It was either prompted or unprompted or no response. And that is what the graph looks like. It's like, this is one of my like favorite types of graphs, right? Cause it's very clear. It's like three things. It's like NR, no response. That means they didn't, they did something other than the tact or nothing within the 10 seconds that they come to that part of the chain prompted or P right. And that is, they gave them a prompt, right? Mm -hmm. We're all there. And M O was the unprompted response. So within the 10 seconds that the, they get to that point in the chain, the participant asks for that missing item. But I love that they called it an M O. So it's very clear. Yeah. You don't have to like get out your ruler and be like, was that eight or 12? So it is interesting. They, Labeled it MO instead of an independent I know. response. Mm-hmm. What is they're trying to indicate what is controlling the response, the prompt or the MO? Which is the MO. Yeah. Yeah. So they use the concurrent multiple baseline design across activities, which I love. And it wasn't across participants, but it was across activities. And the activities were pretty fun. So this is one thing that they did. So, right, for Victor, it was like making an art project, painting a picture, making a sandwich, listening to music, science project. Making juice. Who knew you had to make juice? Where's my juicer? The had, children all say. <laughs> they had powdered <laughs> powder to make juice. So it was Where's good. my fruit ninja? Or what is that what is it that thing the, called? They were making tang. Yeah. They were making tang. <laughs> I love tang. Me too. Making I eat, tang. Well, hey, do you guys want to know a secret tip about me? hmm Sometimes when I'm very stressed out, I keep tang underneath my seat in my car and I eat it raw. I didn't even know you could still purchase Tang. You can. I, I was <laughs> unable to find it when I tried to purchase it. I'll some. show you where you find it. Okay. Wait. Sunny D for me, thanks. <laughs> I'll take the purple stuff. Okay. So, with pre-training, they chose three chains with multiple steps that would presumably be reinforcing due to the terminal reinforcer, right? Like making a sandwich. We all love that. Yep. They started with the vocal prompt to start the activity and then used prompting to teach the chain to 80% mastery. One session was conducted per day for all of the chains. So they didn't know the chains prior to this study. Kind of wish they did. It probably would have saved them time. Sped things up. Right? (laughs) So baseline was the same as pre-training, except one item that was needed to complete the chain was missing. Making a sandwich, the bread was missing, for instance, for Victor. If the participant paused or completed the step incorrectly, prompting was used for that step, and then the participant was allowed to continue independently during baseline. Again, one chain per day. When it came to the mi- to the missing item in the chain, if the participant participant manded for the item within te- ten seconds, it was given immediately. Then the chain was completed. If anything other than the target response was emitted, the trial was over and everything was removed, and no response. So that seems serious. And then it, they were redirected back to their classroom schedule. So that was baseline. During tr- man training, it was set up identical to baseline. But when they came to the missing item, if the target word was not emitted within 10 seconds, a prompt was provided, right? So it was like the most to least prompting that people use or least to most, depending on the participant. 
When the participant said the word, the item was given, the chain was completed. Da, da, da. I'm surprised at the use of, it seems 10 seconds feels like a very long time for the individual to not be manning and not have any means of finishing the chain. It's just like a long time for all sorts of other interfering behavior to potentially occur, or other responses to so occur. I, I have, so I, we talked about that at one point sometime a while ago, and I think for these participants, they needed that time to process. So that was like part of their... So their baseline tended to be, they, they, they required some period longer. of time yeah. before engaging in any... In any any act, response. Okay, right? that makes sense. Then. But I do like I do like that they waited so long. I mean, ten seconds is nothing in the world of seconds, right? Like, but it also gives them time to emit the response and contact the relevant establishing operations, right? They're yeah, like, they're like they can think about it. like imagine when this happens to you, right? Oh, I don't have. This is like what you're saying internally, right? In your in your in internal verbal behavior oh i don't have my pen so hmm what do i need to do right like it gives mm -hmm. them yeah time to then emit the correct response i've certainly oh. sure we've all worked with students though where the idea of 10 seconds without well, having yeah. something you want right? is a real recipe for yeah right and that and that non-learning behavior to right and so with your student you'd want to make sure that you're giving them the amount of time that is needed but not too much time right so that you're not they're not engaging in other behaviors. Good there. point, though, that it's a it's, it's a context related to these these right. participants specifically. So they also provided probes for untrained man responses. So following training, they assessed novel stimuli. So one of the items used to complete the chain was different, and only one difference was completed at a time. So for in the in the like let's say Victor making a sandwich, they use English muffins and bagels instead of bread. They also substituted places and instructors. To see if this very is thorough. very mm -hmm. thorough, right? And they also conducted probes for tack acquisition, which occurred during pre-training to make sure that students could tack the items that they, they were... could ask for the thing. Yes, <laughs> right. That's important. So amazingly, it can happen, right? So during baseline for all of our participants, we really see low responses, no response, no. none, except for Victor with to with with the toaster. He's got like three. Yes, yeah, that's the only three, responding in baseline. Right, three instances. But then you know, there's only a few, a few prompted sessions for all of the participants, and then bam, mo time. <laughs> right, so it can happen. The kids learn how to man for missing items using the interrupted chain procedure. They learn to ask for the missing item only after man training, and the authors posited that. They have potentially established a CEOT. Mm. I don't know why that sounds weird. Condition motivating operation, right, but they call it a skis they it. call it conditioning establishing operation. Like CEOT. Why did I CMOT? Like yes. Now is yes. what we call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. This helped to teach spontaneous mans. Right, because in the absence of the item, participants were engaging in mans, and all of the participants learned tack responses. So that's great too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all in all, very successful. Mm -hmm. And not that many sessions, to be honest. No, it was pretty quick. 30 sessions or so for the most. So, you I know. Like I would have been hesitant to set this up as a multiple baseline across stimuli because I would have anticipated that you would see generalization mm -hmm. across stimuli. But, it, but with that exception of a few points for Victor, where they were probably worried that that was happening, they did not see that no. occur. Mm -mm. And these were concurrent. Yep, they were right? concurrent. Yeah, and so they was... taught the tax before they began for all. Yeah. Okay. I know. Yeah, but they didn't. I mean, they 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 didn't get that. It would be in the grand scheme of things, it's actually nice to get that type of generalization, right. mm -hmm. as long as you haven't put all of your eggs in the basket of an MBL across stimuli. But they didn't. They needed to be trained. Yeah. In all of them. So I'm surprised they chose that experimental design, and that it worked out for them. Right. It's very simple, though. Right. So the procedures here are very easy to yeah, replicate. But, but I would like I, I do wonder if there's some point at which you would start to see generalization across I new hope tasks. So. Mm -hmm. I hope right? so. Right. For the sake of Victor, Nathaniel and Karina. There's such different tasks, though, in terms of the, the different items being used. I mean, some of the kids have the same activities, but, you know, you had your music, you had your art, you had your... But you're still... Uh, the, the manned is not different. Yeah. No, but, really, but manned plus you, item. You that know, that 
You get to a point different. where you're like, where's that thing I need? Mm-hmm. And then you tacked the thing, that, right. the thing that it is across. And, and that had been problem. found in some of the others, in, in some earlier studies yeah. Yeah, yeah. where there was a generic um, Amandin for, I don't know what. Amandin. I'm just Amandin. I'm just Amandin. <laughs> I'm just Amandin. <laughs> so it was definitely a possibility. It could have occurred. But it didn't seem like that's sort of been the norm in most of the previously published research on the interrupted chain procedure. But you're right, Diana. It's one of those things of, in a study, how terrible, but in real life, Yes, that's exactly what we would yeah. want to happen. That's what we would want. I taught two yes. mans in interrupted yes. chain, and now you're always manding when something's Save missing. My life. Right. At what point do you get do you get there? Right? Or or could you have seen it occur if you did like other art projects, mm-hmm. right? Or other food making activity. That you may. That would be interesting that to see. Is like how similar yeah. do the kind of variables mm-hmm. in the environment need to be, the stimuli in the environment need to be to get that type of generalization that hey there you go maybe that's the study all right so i'm going to talk about the roberts panel and sigafoos article from 1999 do you guys remember that i love sigafoos sigafoos only if paired with saggers all right so we chose this article even though it was actually older than the review because they were looking at using this interrupted chain procedure in the context of play and additionally, they were looking at this procedure with individuals who had very, very limited communication skills. And so I was excited that I got to talk about this article because I think it's really important that we are including research for individuals who have limited communication or very, very early learners and who have higher support needs. There's not as much research out there for some of those populations and i think it's important to review it when we have it so i was glad to get to talk about this article so in this study they were using a version of the interrupted chain procedure to teach these children to request more in the context of play that was basically it (laughs) and they review some of the same things that you did jackie you know if someone's not developing language or communication on their own then we would need to teach it I do like that they included this. They said, you know, teaching children to request objects and activities as a first step of communication is really important because it allows the child to exert some degree of control on their environment. And I love that they brought it up and kind of couched it within that terminology, right? Because I don't want anyone to take away that the whole point of interrupted chain is to restrict access (laughs) to something. That's not what we're trying to do here. That's not what we're trying to teach. We're trying to teach this empowerment of manding and asking for other items, continuation of items, et cetera, that children are likely to encounter in their day to day. Mm -hmm. And and I like that they sort of put it into that terminology. And if you could teach all of these mans in the context of, say, incidental teaching, that would be great. But what has been found is that that doesn't always occur. Well, this occur. hand in hand with incidental yeah. teaching. Oh, you, no, you, you can do both, but it does seem like there are periods where behavior chain may have been more effective for teaching the man than in other, other contexts. So it, so it could be possible. It's not, there's no definitive answer that you have to use this, but there have been times, it did seem at least in the kind of the review study that the pre, pre-chain manding wasn't as effective, or teaching that wasn't as effective as trying to teach it in the middle, the, the interrupted chain. So there's potentially you have to use this procedure. Okay. But in both contexts, you're setting up opportunities for Mm -hmm. learning. I feel like that people sometimes get confused on that. That if it's incidental, then I'm never creating an opportunity. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But you can totally create opportunities in incidental teaching. If you didn't, you would never have opportunities to teach something. So it's okay to do that in both of these contexts. But with the behavior chain interruption strategy... They talk about how it's been demonstrated already to be quite useful to teach requesting skills, but a lot of it has been done with students who already have some way of commu- of indicating their communicative intent. So they might already have pointing or gestures or vocal language of some type. What they wanted to do in this study was replicate that but and extend it to working with individuals who and their quote was required pervasive supports and had severe communication impairment. And I think that that is a really important area to look at. So they had three participants in the study. There was Mark, Emma, and Adam. They were all three years old. They had a variety of diagnoses, including developmental disabilities, 
visual impairment, seizure disorder, intellectual disabilities, and autism. And then the way they wanted to do was pick three different activities that were going to be the context in which they taught the more request for the participants. And they chose those based on teacher and parent report. So for each child, they had three activities. Two of them were used for training and one was used for generalization. For Mark, it was going down the slide using a music player, like a CD player, and a vibrating switch that like vibrated when you touched it. Not a Nintendo switch, though. No, this was pre, pre that type of switch. For Emma, it was a bumble ball. Are you familiar with that? Uh, yeah, I am. Okay. <laughs> That sounded weird. I've just, I, I know of this toy. <laughs> well, it's a great toy. It's, it's a really, really cool. Fun toy. A lot of fun. You can play a little bouncing game with your student. You can play a hot potato version with mm-hmm. the bumble ball. Yep. You can chase it around. It, it also has a vibrating mechanism inside of it that it can be turned on and off. And on the outside, it has what look to be like oversized gumdrops, basically, mm-hmm. that make it kind of like jump around. That, a massager, and then a radio that was operated by a switch. And then for Adam, they also used the massager. They had a keyboard that played music. And then he also had the music CD player. He was into music, I think. And then for each of them, the response that was going to be taught was also individualized. For Mark, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to say earlier in, in the participant description that Mark was starting to use a few words to request. But they said that he seemed to be using them indiscriminately. So like he, he used yogurt to mean requesting for any item. Emma communicated only through facial expressions, tantrums, and reaching for items. And then Adam communicated through self-injury, tantrums, and facial expressions. So most of them did not have a lot of language, although Mark did seem to have some emerging language and echoic responding as well, because they used verbal prompting for him. So for Mark, the goal was that he was going to verbalize more plus the noun, so like more slide. For Emma, it was that she would sign more, the sign more. And for Adam, initially they were going to use signing for him, but he he didn't demonstrate that independently. And then before they taught it, his parents decided they would rather teach him to touch a line drawing of the of something related to more. And that was on the table and he just needed to touch it. So they changed to that during baseline. So they have baseline for both of those. And then they went on to teach the touching of the line drawing for him. And this one was a multiple baseline across participants. They were measuring the training of this response as well as the initiation of this response, generalization and maintenance. And in baseline, they had them engage in the activity and then they paused the activity either through just like kind of like kind of like moving themselves in the way, I think, of the item. So like what they call passively blocking access to it, turning off the control switch, or just not offering another turn to engage with it again. And then, this is important, even in baseline, the trainer then said, do you want more? They waited 10 seconds. And then they non-contingently, in baseline, offered the item again after 10 seconds, independent of responding, including if they tantrumed or gave a different response or anything like that. And so all the baseline sessions had two to four of those per session. And everyone needed training to just go ahead and tell you that part. So then an intervention, same as baseline, except now after they said, do you want more? They then prompted their response. And for this study, they started with a zero second delay and then went up to up to 10 seconds, depending on the participant. And the way that the prompting was arranged was idiosyncratic and, you know, individualized per participant mastery was 80 percent independent use of the target request over three sessions and then once that was trained then they did generalization however that only occurred for mark and emma because adam did not acquire this skill that's part of their results too so for mark and emma that third setting that i mentioned in the list of the activities that they did was presented as a new context and otherwise it was the same as baseline meaning they didn't prompt in that condition And then they looked to see if responding maintained for those two participants over several weeks, which is pretty good. And then they also did something that you were kind of referencing, Rob, called initiation probes. So towards the end of training and then in the generalization and maintenance conditions, they also 
check to see if requesting more occurred at the beginning of the activity to initiate play, as well as during the activity to request continuance. However, I found this odd because that's not really how you want to teach them Mm -hmm. the term more because it really should be used as a request for continuation of an activity versus as the beginning of an activity. So they didn't, only for Emma did they actually see that occur. The other two, they did not see that occur, but it seemed a little funky to me. Their IOA was 100%. They only collected it in 15 to 20% of sessions. But I guess that was okay. Now for the results, Mark and Emma, like I said, both learned the skill. Mark reached mastery criterion when the prompt was at a 10 second delay. Emma reached it at a three second delay. Both showed responding in the generalization condition. Although for Mark, it was initially only about 60% in that condition. And then it went up to the mastery level. Adam did not learn this skill even at a 10 second delay. Although in baseline, it was it was 0%. In training, it went up to 40%. but It didn't seem like something he was particularly interested in doing. Mm. And then, like I said, Emma did do this initiation that they were looking for, and Mark and Adam really didn't. They had low initiation, but I don't know that it was a great (laughs) request to teach you initiation for, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. And then from Mark and Emma, the maintenance data looked good under those conditions as well. So limitations that they listed in the study were that Emma did sign more once during baseline, which is not like the end of the world or anything like that. It's, you know, but it does demonstrate that she probably had that response already in her repertoire. So they said they know that other people were working on more with her, which is, you know, I wouldn't call it like problematic with a capital P. It just means that she may have been getting additional practice with this skill outside of this the setting of sessions. And she did learn the skill really quickly. So they, you know, because initially they they were saying, oh, you know, this interrupted chain is great because it really creates this high motivating opportunity. And we would expect to see the response be acquired under those conditions. And they said, well, for her, we don't know. Was it really that it was so highly motivating or was it that she was getting a lot of practice outside of sessions? We don't really know. But both of those things not research wise, but clinical wise, like clinically, if you're getting a lot of practice yeah. and you're admitting it, that's great. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Right, so but research wise, yes, I understand why they had to put it there. Right. Yeah. And then they didn't do the the generalization and the initiation probes and baseline, so they didn't have baseline data on how they responded under those conditions, which is, I guess, a minor limitation. But they didn't show any, except for that one time Emma signed more. No one else showed any indication of independent responding in baseline. So there's that. And then they talk about Adam and he did not acquire the skill. They said they really didn't think that what they had planned for him was sufficiently motivating, which 100% makes sense, right? The the whole idea here is that it is a naturally occurring reinforcer that's going to maintain or, you know, create the opportunity for responding and then maintain responding after the response is acquired. They really just didn't think they had that with him from the beginning. So I don't think they were particularly surprised that He didn't acquire the response. And then my limitations, I just want to make sure I throw out there, is they always had that SD of do you want more Yeah, built in across all of the conditions, even in the maintenance phase, that, that was always there. So it does seem to me like a potential confound in that you don't know if that response was controlling the behavior or the MO was controlling the behavior. And for Mark, it was even the same, you know, topography of the response that they were looking for from from him. And then they were using the echoic prompting after that. So it was almost like the, the echoic was kind of re- remained in place. So that's, you know, a potential. I do think that we want to see research that's done with groups that need higher levels of support. So I don't want to you know, discount this research entirely. And maybe that was a necessary component for it. But it does muddy what we can say about how the interrupted chain procedure operates with respect to, to motivation. Right. And then the other piece here is, you know, whenever I 
teach on this topic and talk about it, I talk about it in the context of a chain of behavior, right? You have a series of responses, the initial SD kicks it off, and then each you know, preceding response functions as the SD for the following response, and that response functions as the reinforcer for the preceding response until you get to the end terminal reinforcer, right? right? But in this study, there was no clear chain mm-hmm. of behavior. They were just enjoying the item that they were playing with, right? Like the CD player was on, having a cool time with it. It gets paused. And then someone says, do you want more? And I say, or I sign more. And it gets turned back on. To me, there's not a series of responses there that are reinforcing the previous response until you get to the terminal reinforcer, right? Mm -hmm. So it mm-hmm. doesn't seem to me to map on quite the same way mm. to the way in which we typically talk about the interrupted chain procedure. I was thinking the same thing, to right? be honest, right? And I don't think that this is a, a bad procedure, what they did here. I think it was really appropriate for their participants, and they, they got some of the response that they were looking for. But to me, it was just like, teaching (laughs) yeah teaching (laughs) that's what you did maybe versus this really specific interrupted chain procedure so those were my takeaways neat from this one yeah great now i really quickly did want to discuss the summer's article not so much because i think the procedures are too dissimilar to the other articles we discussed because but but i do think it captures kind of some of the the fun differences in the ways and the context in which we use language so overall kind of the same study you know students that are manding and oh if we make it so that they don't have the items where they think they are and we do the kind of interrupted chain they'll man for items or in in this case these students already could man for items but they'll man for rather than the item they'll man where you'll man for information right so kind of the same idea and it worked it was great but i did really like the the general setup and the distinction between a manned and a manned for information as occurring at different times. You manned for an item when the item is present out of your reach. You don't manned for an item if you have the item in front of you. And you man for information when there's an item you want and you don't know where the item is. You don't have the information to find that item. So in this study, they had sort of the three chains in which the children would pick these pictures, you know, from preferred items that they that they wanted. And then they'd take them over to a shelf and they'd match the picture and they'd open the drawer and either the item was in there, in which case you wouldn't mand. But there's always that concern. Am I over, you know, is the child overgeneralizing that I should always ask for items, even if they're present, because, I, you know, I, that's that's the, that's where the reinforcement has come in. So I want them to not mand. They'd have nothing in the drawer, but then, uh oh, look over here. The teacher's got it over here. Ha ah, I got it from you, kid. That's when the man, I want whatever the item is, would occur. And then they open the drawer. There's nothing in there. Teacher, I don't know. I don't, I don't, it doesn't say if they gave a look, like, I don't know where the heck it is, you know, or whatever to the, to the child. And that's where they would man where is whatever the, wherever the item is. Where's toy in that situation? And again, the procedure itself, there was nothing too fancy here. There were the audio tape scripts rather than vocal scripts, which I thought was a a little different than what I usually see. But it was prompted, was the prompt either when the item was held by the teacher or when the item was completely missing. One student didn't really even need these to be faded. One student didn't need them to be faded. And all the students were able to discriminate when to man for the item, when to man for information, and when to just take the item and not man for anything because there was no need to man for it. I think that's the big takeaway of that, right? Is mm-hmm. that they're teaching discriminatable mans, mm-hmm. right? Which is important. Yeah. So again, not anything too exciting in terms of overall procedure or findings, but I did think this was interesting when we talked sort of about the idea of generalization of like, what if the interrupted chain's not occurring enough, you know, or what if it's not occurring in different contexts? I think this sort of, you know, was a, was a way to sort of build some multiple exemplar training into the activity or into the training itself. And then also to think about when are you going to man in the environment? And these were individuals who already had 20 man. So these weren't some of the participants that we described in some of the other studies who had no mans or almost never manded or only manded with very specific prompts or cues in place. So perhaps this wasn't a procedure for all participants, but I, I did think it was an interesting way to think about, you know, the different means of manding why would you mand why would manding in this context not be appropriate or 
be something you didn't want to teach. But also just the idea of manding for information is is also a man. I think we kind of sometimes are like, man, I, they could just get 50 items that they man for. That'll be it. We will never do manned training again. Like, you get 50 items. There's still a lot more that, uh, you know, a, a neuro, a, you know, neurotypical, typically developing child will manned in a day. So you, you can, don't don't just rest on your laurels there. That's good. But, you know, come back to it the next day. So. Again, just another extension of some of this interrupted chain research that I thought was interesting for sort of the setting more than maybe the procedure. And with that out of the way, let's move in to Dissemination Station. So when it comes to using the interrupted chain procedure, this is one of those procedures that I feel like a lot of listeners are like, it's nice to know there's research, but I already do this pretty frequently and hopefully learn something. I don't know if there's anything in here that conceptually is going to be hard to wrap one's head around. Like I said, I think, you know, this is a procedure we'd either heard about or used without knowing it had a name before. But, you know, this is a good chance to review a procedure and review the mechanisms behind it or the potential mechanisms behind it, as well as some variations on the use of the treatment to, you know, take back to your own practice. One thing we never talked about is what does an interruption look like? You know, we sort of mentioned it a few times, and it does seem like from older research that could include things such as the, you know, aforementioned yoink. There were some studies. Yoink seems a little mean. And well, there were some studies. There were some studies where they actually blocked the child from being able to complete. I don't think that the, we should do that. Though. No, I don't think we should. I'm just saying that has been that has been in research that has been published and that was, you know, we didn't get into it specifically but that was part of the review you know the 2001 review so when we're talking about interruptions while there are lots of forms which ones do you think do you think we would we would probably endorse starting with not that one yeah (laughs) right i think that's mean Mm -hmm. i think you're probably going to see a lot of emotional responding if you're just like yoink right i like the either the the far away but insight manned for those that may have difficulties with out of sight right or just the missing item. That's where the setup comes in. Yep. If it's missing and you didn't take it, well, you took it, but you took it when nobody knew you took right. it. Yeah. That's very different than just removing it at the last minute. Right. Something being broken, perhaps you could do in front of the individual. If like, oh, no, it's not working. You know, you could fake that. I think that would probably be the closest to a yoink without actually yoinking anything away. Like, I can't turn your iPad on. Or, yeah. oh, no, I it's glued, the wrong button. Like I glued one time for a toy, I glued a boulder inside of the toy. Mm-hmm. And then they couldn't get it out. And they're like, it's broken. I'm like, this one's not. Right. Yeah. Right. So, but it was more, na- it seemed more naturally occurring, right? Because it wasn't me looking like the bad guy. Like, I'm yeah. taking this away from you so that you can emit yeah. a response. That just seems mean and creepy. Interrupt your chain ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. Before, so that the participants, it's looking more natural, right? Mm-hmm. It's not looking exactly. like mm-hmm. you're an aversive stimulus then. But I think it's one of the other reasons that. If it's not set up ahead of time, the odds of that just happening, like this boulder just happens to be jammed in right. there and is impossible to get out. The odds of that happening naturally are, are, are very, set. very low. So yeah. this is a procedure I think, I don't want to say is a, is a negative to it, but it is one you have to plan for ahead of time if you don't want to, you know, just be yoinking away and hoping for the best, which is not ideal. Yeah. So current research. Right. And, but that's not really what happened. Like it should be the, no. the type of situations that one would encounter in real life. So that you've had practice with those ahead of time. So like things go missing a lot. But if someone's taking something from you, then you're not, this isn't even the response that you would teach, right? Like, where's my thing? It would be, give that back to me. Mm -hmm. That would be an appropriate response to teach if that's a situation the student's encountering. That could be. There there are contexts where there are children who don't band Uh for items back when other children take them. Exactly. Yeah, but I wouldn't, then that wouldn't be this this response where is the thing no but it would still be it would be mandating for missing item but the form the form might change specific context and only if that child is already experiencing that then you might try to figure out how to help them Mm -hmm. but that is different to me than than what you're usually trying to do here so i think if you right are often encountering the you know the ipad breaking or something like that then you'd want to set up opportunities so that then when it happens in real life, you've prepared them for how right. to respond. Mm-hmm. Some future research that we are looking at right now is does this affect, does this, is this effective procedure when the MO is not as strong, right? So like in a vocational task, 
So that's something that we're currently looking at right now Mm -hmm. with some... I like my job, but I don't love it. Right? So it's not like, oh my gosh, (laughs) I want this iPad, but oh, I need, you know, I need the cloth to finish wiping this table. But it's mildly reinforcing, right? But it's not like the best thing. So that's something that we're looking at right now. And also... We're negatively reinforcing, right? right? We're Mm -hmm. negatively reinforcing. You can get this done so I can get out and play some things. Oh, that's always, oh man, there's just no rags and guess it's time to go home. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) And also what this would look like in the context of your everyday routines at home. Mm -hmm. So like when you're packing your backpack up or when you're getting ready for school. So again, when it's not as reinforcing, like you have to get dressed. Do you just put your pants on and not put underwear on? Maybe, Mm -hmm. right? Or do you go ask someone for some underwear? Looking at more... Less reinforcing, but still slightly reinforcing due to the finishing of the chain. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So those are the two things that you might see in in future research that my students are currently Mm -hmm. working on. Other need underpants? I need I mean I don't know I can't remember what exactly it is. I don't (laughs) think it's not actually I don't think it's I need underpants, but Right, like it was like I. We've need... secretly switched all of the underpants with no underpants. No, like the one I'm thinking of, spe- like specifically the the home chain was packing a backpack. Mm-hmm. Okay, and Great. needs all the things that he needs to go to school, and he's missing, like the red binder that's got his yeah. Yeah. work in it. Right. Yep. So he needs to go and ask for it. Right. If I look in at my, my own, own children, life, my yeah. children do not notice when those things are missing. <laughs> no, they <laughs> don't. Was, they don't mend for them. <laughs> Hence, that was. This is where we're coming into. So. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, so looking at how reinforcing the chain is. Mm-hmm. But other than those, I think many of the variables in terms of how you would run this treatment are, you know, use the topography of prompting that makes sense for your learner. And other than that, you're good to go. Do it. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our discussion on the interrupted chain procedure, a.k.a. the behavior chain interruption strategy. I want to thank all of you so much for listening to our episode. We really appreciate it. And as a big thanks, I want to make sure to give you the second secret code word you need if you'd like to purchase CEs. It is Pie. P I E. Someday I want the code word to be my name. Just putting it out there. <laughs> okay. Keep it in mind. There are lots of different pies you can eat. You probably need eggs to make your pie crust, I guess. But if you know, you don't you don't need eggs necessarily if you buy it at the store. Today I had strawberry rhubarb pie. Thanks that's right. to Anna and yeah. Bob, and that's my favorite. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. And this episode's gonna come out real close to Pie Day. Oh, great. Yeah. But it's spelled wrong. If you spell pie, then we're gonna think of big... accept either. I won't though. <laughs> Good thing you don't do that. It's only the it's only the edible form of pie, not the mathematical, no, no, no. not the mathematical uh, d- d- expression. Anyway, pie. Again, thank you so much for listening to ABA Inside Track. We'd love it if you left us a review and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you like to get your podcasts. There are a lot of other places you can find us. You can get us on all the socials at ABA Inside Track. You can find all these episodes posted on YouTube with the YouTube subtitling feature. You can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, to find links to all of the articles we discussed, as well as to purchase CEs for any of our 190-plus episodes we have out there right now. And hey, if you want even more ABA Inside Track content, why not go over and subscribe to our show at patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where for $5 a month, you can get early access to our episodes, plus access to some special videos, get at discounts at the CE store, some Q&As, as well as to be able to vote and to join us for some of our live recording episodes. We have another one of those coming out pretty soon, I think, when this is posting, how to check the calendar. If you want even more longer content, maybe up to two hours of discussion on a various on various books, well, why not join us at the $10 level for our ABA Inside Track Book Club episodes? We have four of those every year, or at least the years we've done so far. <laughs> we'll see what the future holds. Most recently, we released our discussion of the Aspergian Memoir, Look Me in the Eye by John Elder Robeson. That was a fun discussion, a little bit different topic, but a good review of the individual life of a man diagnosed with Asperger's in his 40s. So much later on in life and how that affected his development as an individual. Again, that's patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. A couple other big thanks. Big thanks to Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for his interstitial music, and Death Abbott of the Podcast Doctors for his editing work. We'll be back next week, but until then, you're the man to now, dog. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.